Cool. Mouth breathing. This has been a hot and at sometimes controversial point within orthodontics for many years. It was first came to light um, by some research by Linda Aronson, who was a researcher in Sweden, who, as, as rumour has it, went to a drinks party where an ENT specialist asked his opinion on the improvement of the occlusion and facial appearance of children following adnectomies and tonsillectomies. Linda Aronson looked somewhat bemused at the ENT specialist who then invited him down to his clinic where he observed firsthand the changes that are occurring following um, the removal of adenoids and tonsils. Linda Aronson then took some, uh, did some research taking x-rays of these um, children who had got complete nasal obstruction. Of course, he wanted to take a group of people that were extremes so that it made a nice clear cut um, research. And he took some individuals who had complete nasal obstruction so they couldn't breathe out of their nose at all because of, in part, adenoid um, hypertrophy. And he then, he took some x-rays, he then uh, they had the adenoids removed and he split them into two groups, the ones that who now could breathe out of their noses and the ones that still couldn't breathe out of the noses because removing the adenoid tissue would make no difference. And he then watched those two groups and the two groups changed, they varied, or rather the group that then could breathe out of their noses changed and became different from the ones that still couldn't breathe out of their noses. And he gained a um, two standard deviations of significant difference between the two of them. And to convert that to um, layman's language, that means a 1 in 20 in a 1 in 20. That's a very unlikely chance that it was a chance. So it's almost certain some change happened. And many changes happened. I mean, the front teeth straightened up, um, changed their inclination and straightened up. The facial sh dimensions changed. The faces grew up and forwards more. And interestingly, the faces started becoming more normal. If they were then compared to a normal group of individuals, these faces became more like normal faces. So it was a, a significant piece of research. It um, at the time changed orthodontics. It was probably responsible for a lot of adenoidectomies. An enormous amount of children went under surgery based on that piece of research. Now, the changes he observed weren't that large, although they were very statistically significant. And it caused a revolution at the time, which has reverted almost in the opposite direction, where people now don't take adenoids out for um, breathing matters. But it's interesting to discuss what happened, what observed, because he wasn't wrong. He got two significant deviations away. That was you know, it was interesting, there was some truth there. Um, it caused uh, a group of individuals, um, Woodside, Linda Aronson, um, and some others, to really examine breathing. And I, I think there's a possibility that they could have headed off down the wrong alley, because what they then looked at was the amount of air being breathed through the nose and the amount of air being breathed through the mouth. And they were really trying to work out if this was a indicator of what type of malocclusion you would get or the severity of your malocclusion. And they tried to, to change the, um, where, how you were breathing and with the hope of making malocclusion better or easier to treat at least. Now, where I think they missed the point is that if you breathe through your nose, 
Your tongue may be raised on the roof of your mouth and your mouth may be closed with the lips sealed or it may not be because if you're breathing out of your mouth the way your tongue, lips and mouth are are, sorry, right, if you know, the way your tongue, lips and mouth are is then fairly irrelevant. It's not related to the system of how you're breathing. However, if you're breathing through your mouth, then your tongue has to be low, your mouth has to be open, and your lips are separated. And it's this difference, I think, that has confounded much of the research. I think, and the evidence supports me in suggesting that it's the position of the tongue, the mandible and lips that are vitally important. The top jaw, the maxilla, sits on top of the tongue. We forget how large the tongue is, it extends all the way down to the hyoid. And the whole of the top jaw sits with the direct forces from the tongue holding the top jaw up. You have the indirect forces from the teeth when the mouth is closed. And if the tongue is down and the mandible is hung open, you change this force system. And if the tongue's down and the mouth's open, the maxilla can drop down. And as it drops down, of course, it can become narrower and shorter reducing the cross-sectional area, in fact, forcing the tongue further down into the airway, but leaving less space also for the teeth. And also, of course, as the maxilla gets narrower, it narrows the nasal capacity. So, if the underlying cause of your nasal obstruction was some form of nasal congestion, the net effect it has is to make your nose narrower and more liable to congest in a classic vicious cycle. Now, the orthodontic practice tends to ignore breathing now. It's almost as if the profession has felt, well, we, we looked at that and we realised there was nothing in there. And now we can ignore that. However, if you finish orthodontic treatment, or you're in orthodontic treatment, hanging your mouth open with your tongue down can make the treatment more difficult. And it can invite relapse. So I think it's very, very important to change that factor, to learn to have your tongue on the roof of your mouth with your lips closed. And of course, if you can't breathe out of your nose, you can't have your tongue on the roof of your mouth, the lips sealed on your mandible closed. So it's vitally important to maintain a clear nasal passage for your general health, as well as your craniofacial structure, the way it develops, and of course, the alignment of your teeth. Now, I always hesitate to advocate a medical route to gaining a clear nose for uh, treating nasal obstructions, congestions, or whatever. A short-term burst of medication can be useful, and um, I'm sure it does not cause prolonged harm, but it I concerns me that many people seem to be on medications for sections of their life for such conditions, and I would hesitate to advocate that. I'm very impressed with the research some anecdotal, but some very evidence-based, on the Butego method of breathing. Um, I know Patrick McEwen in Ireland has recently done a, um, some research showing some quite good changes in nasal obstruction, um, uh, rhinitis, literally 
from changing your pattern, your method of breathing, your mode of breathing. And I would highly recommend uh, instigating Butego therapy. It's simple and it's easy and it doesn't cost much. It just takes some effort, which is um, important. And I would highly recommend that for anyone in thinking of orthodontic treatment. But in essence, the message that we give out within orthotropics has not changed. Your tongue should be on the roof of your mouth. Your teeth should be in or near contact most of the time. And your lips should be sealed. That is defined by the tropic premise. And with standing up straight, keeping your mouth closed, that is the best way to guarantee good facial development. And that's the best way to having straight teeth permanently throughout life. And if you want that, then you need to breathe through your nose.